Um, oh, there we go. I should say that there are a couple of images of uh, human remains in this talk. There are also a couple of images of osteoarchaeologists, so if either of those would upset you, uh, look away now. So, uh, Thomas Rickman. Thomas Rickman, antiquarian, English uh, sort of architect, uh, takes a tour of Britain or England in the early 19th century in, uh, to, in his words, attempt to discriminate the styles of English architecture. In 1819, he turns up at Bath and St. Peter's. Um, and uh, it's a revelation because he sees the top stage of that church and he understands it as being early Norman in form. And thus, everything underneath it must be early. And St. Peter's becomes his first uh, sort of confirmed, accepted structure that has Anglo Saxon stone uh, building to it. So St. Peter's is sort of famous in architectural circles and archaeological circles through the 19th to 20th century, and there's lots of um, attempted investigations that go on, uh, none of them with any great skill or care, to establish the date of this uh, church and its original form. Uh, and eventually in the 1970s, late 1970s, Warwick and Kirsty Rodwell uh, begin work on a formal excavation within the tower and what was later to confirm, be confirmed to be uh, the baptistry, the only Anglo-Saxon baptistry <coughs> surviving as a pointer. Yes. Um, and they end up doing seven years of work, and they confirm that this building is of a uh, very early 11th century in date, and it starts off as a little three-celled unit, and almost as a byproduct, they happen to come across 2,803 people whilst they're doing it. And that assemblage of human remains, that resource, um, has been recognized really ever since as uh, nationally and internationally important. Oh, that was probably the wrong thing to press. Good. Oh, and there's a nice side view. So, oh, hello. Hello. It's a good start, isn't it? Uh, this being the tower, this being the top stage, the baptistry, and essentially there's another cell very much the size of that was on this side. So, it's this tiny little three cell early 11th century church. So, um, in this. Uh, in this paper, I'm, I'm reflecting on, or I should say that that assemblage was then from 2007 housed in an ossuary, so a bone store within this building. And today's paper is a reflection on the establishment of that ossuary and its management over the last 15 years, and on the human resource, human remains resource itself, it's, um, how it's been used, with what impact, at what cost and to whose benefit. So the Rodwell excavations, oh, that's pixelated nicely, um, were sort of landmark in presenting a holistic uh, study of both the above ground archaeology and the below ground archaeology and all of the documentary and collection of material that sort of goes into this whole history of, of this building. Um, it's a, so, yeah, it's sort of a, that sense of burial, burial archaeology and linking um, the stratigraphy of the graves, the nature of the grave, the nature of the burial, the finds of the burial, and of course the individual is really sort of setting a new standard, a, a new ambition, if you like, in how we can approach this kind of archaeology. Um, and the idea, I think, also at that time, of the retention of such a huge assemblage of human remains out of the ground, not going back, not being reburied. The church had been made redundant in 1971, so it was relatively difficult to put it back in the ground here. Retention in this case meant going to the uh, Bristol Royal Infirm Infirmary, where Juliet Rogers, who was a specialist in, um, in sort of uh, joint disease, took on the task with her students of, of cataloguing and quantifying and measuring, uh, creating a basic record of this huge resource. And what we know of, it, of its passage at that time is that it would live in the basement of the Bristol Royal Infirmary or in various labs, or it might get shuffled off to someone's garage because there wasn't space anymore, and then it ended up in an attic or two, 
I think it ended up in the basement of the local museum in Barton, before eventually arriving at a large warehouse in York, which is where I found it in 2005 when I started, um, spilling, sort of overspilling its boxes and its paper bags, splitting at the sides, and kind of a horror story, really. Um, but eventually we had this plan to create, um, oh, that's an example of a skeletal sheet from this one right in Eventually, we had a plan to create an ossuary, and that tied in with the publication of this report in 2005, um, making recommendations uh, around the retention and the care of and the study of human remains. And it was seen, English Heritage was a co author on the report, and it was seen as the Barton pro Project was seen as an excellent sort of exemplar uh, case study in how to implement some of the work from this document, and the thinking of this document, we had local regeneration funding, and we, uh, we built uh, a kind of modern storage facility in the 19th century organ chamber of this redundant church, which is lovely. We took our 2,803 individuals, and we correlated every single one of them with the bone record sheets to try and establish that we had the right people in the right bag. We marked every single bone, we repacked it, we created roller wrapping, uh, we created environmental systems to keep the, um, the space in check, and we plonked it all back on the shelves. And it felt like a, a store that was really fit for the assemblage. Um, so what of this resource? It's 1,500 boxes. It's about 30 cubic meters of material. Um, it's 3,000 people, give or take, spread across a thousand years of Barton's history. Barton is, well, it's a town certainly from the 8th century onwards. Uh, sitting on the Humber Estuary at one point before Hull, it's one of the more important port uh, points on the estuary. Um, and the assemblage is seen as important because of its size because of its date range, and because through Rodwell's work, they were able to phase the archaeology to such a degree that you can block out these 3,000-ish individuals into relatively even phases of relatively even numbers of, uh, of examples. So it became, and re remains, um, a hugely significant resource that has always been uh, a basis for Academic research. It was academic research within the Bristol Royal Infirmary, where their early development of systems and approaches within osteoarchaeology, um, in some ways, sort of reduced the population to this condensed sense of zeros and ones and odd codes, this kind of secret language that only a select few could could get access to. Uh, but they reveled or revealed, sorry, um, pathology and trauma. They, they the odd trepanned head, the odd sword wound. Um, and Juliet Rogers herself, as a specialist in joint disease, took on this sort of osteoarthritis aspect and the study of the way that disease manifested in the joints of the, uh, of the buried population informed our modern understanding of the progression of that disease. So this was also a resource that was assisting modern medical science. Since um, 2007, we've had a steady flow of doctoral and postdoctoral researchers coming through the ossuary. We have a um, Barton and Humber Research Committee, which is formed of members from Historic England. There's usually a specialist osteoarchaeologist, a member of the diocese, a member of the parish, and a representative of the English heritage. We act as a sort of filtering body for those who wish to study the remains. And that's particularly important if there's uh, a request for interventive uh, research. Uh, and indeed, if there is such a request, that has to then come through English Heritage's own committee to decide whether or not we're content to do that kind of destructive analysis. But um, we've had a steady stream uh, covering subjects such as, I need my writing for this, stress indicators in childhood, chronic illness, and the timing and trajectory of puberty. Physical impairment and disability Anglo Saxon England, and of course, examining the genetic and environmental factors and their impact on the endochronological and appositional bone growth trajectories. 
Thank you. Um, as we're all about quantifying these archaeological archives at the moment, that's around 25 studies over 15 years, each of which is three to five weeks. It rolls out at something like a two years constant study within that 15 year period on just this one assembly. Uh, and that's by around 10 institutions those students have come from, or the research have come from, uh, across, I think, six, possibly seven different nationalities where the institutions are based. So it feels like this you know, incredible global resource, people come from near and far to spend a heck of a long time studying it in great detail. Um, unfortunately, the Ossery is also resource hungry. Um, the Ossery sits in Barton, which is about an hour and a half from our nearest hub, curatorial hub. It sits in a church uh, which is occupied, if there's a blue moon, or the pigs are flying, um, which is of course not what was presented when we agreed to put the Ossuary in. It would be open five days a week, nine to five. Mm. So um, we have this amazing assemblage that sits in this empty church that's locked most of the time. Um, we have, so that it makes trekking science and touch of care tremendously difficult because we have to go all the way down and then we have to find the local key keeper who will let us in and sit there whilst we do our job and then give the key back, etc. Um, it's challenging because of the environment, because actually, though it looks lovely on the photographs, um, actually, it still sits within unrendered walls and um, 19th century stained glass windows, so the air exchange within the building is poor. Um, and we're finding now that we're getting damp rising up through the floor. It's challenging because the maintenance systems are expensive and they're fallible and they will break down and you realise that you haven't looked at your monitoring often enough and uh, something has spikes and things are not looking very happy. It's a challenge because um, it's a security risk. There's quite a lot of antisocial behaviour in Barton these days. Always has been. It goes in cycles, and occasionally they come back to the beaters having been moved on from somewhere else, and they'll start a fire at the door just next to where the ostrich is. Doesn't give you palpitations at all. Um, but it's also a challenge for researchers because Barton's at the tag end of nowhere, and most researchers don't researchers don't have a car, and there's precious nowhere to stay in Barton, so they have to go to Hull and get a bus in every day. And I have to find someone to babysit the church for the five weeks that someone wants to look at the measurement of a small finger or something. And the whole thing becomes actually quite onerous and difficult to maintain. And in some ways, that was it came to its um, logical conclusion during lockdown, mentioning it again, where we, after the event, realized we hadn't actually fully understood how our own m &E systems worked and that the ventilation system that moves air around actually is on a PIR and gets triggered if you go into the building. So that's fine, normally, because a staff member will go in two or three times a week just to check the place for security and they will trigger it and it will move the air around. But if no one does that for four months, the building's not very happy. And we have mould. Our collection's gone mouldy. Every box, just about, that we've sampled. Plastic bags inside the box, they've got mould on them. Bones got mould on it. Excellent. It's about 40, 40 grand at the moment, I'm estimating, to discard all those cardboard boxes and wipe down 20,000 plus plastic bags with alcohol wipes and do everything with face masks on and fly back suits. Give me a game. So, our dear Osprey, um, and our dear Penge. Yeah, it's there's a kind of simplistic sense of, of, of what actually is this resource, in a way. The researchers come and they spend a lot of time, and then Barton appears as a statistical footnote in the Journal of Left Feet, um, which measured you know, the length of your little toe in urban and rural centres in the Northern Hemisphere. You think, oh, 15%. What's that mean? And there's a real, there's a sense between myself and Simon May, who's a historian of the but this resource is actually quite resource intensive, intensive, but incredibly niche. And it's sitting in this building, which is at risk, and it's a resource that's pretty much hidden from its community, even though it is, in fact, the deceased community 
spot on. And that, much of that is my fault over 15 years of not keeping pushing the idea of engagement, I think. Um, so, Simon and I, in 2018, were working on the idea of how to make the resource more visible and more relevant. And for Simon, that was looking at a new research strategy, which wasn't just about how Barton could contribute to the measurement of toes in a big global study, but how the assemblage could actually start telling us more about Barton as a town over its 1,000 year history. And that kind of seems obvious, but we just hadn't done it. Um, and we also thought, obviously, that more engagement with the local population to build advocacy and, and sort of awareness of what we had and the preciousness of what was in there, given the anti-social behavior, seemed like a good strategy. So we developed a few ideas, a few project proposals, went out for some funding, weren't successful. I better just check my time. Okay. Um, they weren't successful, and then the pandemic hit and everything ground to a halt. But actually, and I found myself quite um, relieved in some ways that those applications for funding didn't get anywhere because I think I think sort of engagement we were planning was was almost a bit tick box where you know you go out and you invite someone to um, gasp at the deformed nature of bone you put in front of them or. Um, or invite them to fumble the fibula, or well, my favourite is to ask, you know, um, introduce the idea of sort of uh, mortality to a primary school child and, and say, how much of you would there be left after 100 years in the ground, Jenny? Uh, but um, somehow that feels, and quite often is, quite sort of shallow in some ways, and it's quite short term, and it might be nice why the few people do it, but it's soon forgotten and you don't really. You don't really sort of uh, persist with it. Um, and I don't know whether it's a trauma of the pandemic or the trauma of the mold, but I, I, I was sort of serious in some ways, it did affect me. Um, but it feels like there's something more fundamental to be done with this particular assemblage. It is a strange thing having the bones in this ossuary in that church. It's not like going into your store. And they're in amongst everything else, even if you've got a segregated human remains area. There is something very special about going to Barton, going to that church, and going to the ossuary. Um, it doesn't feel like this idea of calling it a resource, you know, it's not. It's the, it's, the, it's the deceased community of Barton. And it feels like that when you go into the ossuary. And, um, and I think if we, I, I, I desperately want to do some public engagement, but I think. We've got to go back to basics and actually find out what the relationship, try and understand what the relationship is between the living community and their dead community. And, you know, what, if people have some awareness that this is there, what does that, what does that trigger in them? What does they, what does, is there any sense of responsibility or sense of connection with these people? Is there any sense of intrigue or interest about what these people might tell them about their own ancestry? And I think I've got to go back really to that point. So we're producing now a project design that's more about survey work and engagement on that level to understand what that assemblage might mean to its community. And if it doesn't really mean anything, that's fine. I'll just put a load more data into the journal of left feet and they can publish away, but if we find little triggers, we find little just things we can latch on to, then I think we can produce a program of engagement and a research strategy, dark and focus, that really does at last start to bring this collection, whatever that collection is, back home for a per, you know, it was, it was sent back to Barton because it was felt, you know, that's where it should be, it belongs there, these people belong there. Well, frankly, 15 years, it could have been anywhere else and it would have been a lot easier if it had been. So I think I, I just want to, I want to make a, a reason for that material being back in its community. That's all a bit of a cobbled ending. But there we go. Thank you.